A good morning, good afternoon, and good night for those connected today. Welcome to the launching of the report, Women in Higher Education, Has the Female Advantage Put an End to Gender Inequalities? This would be an open dialogue to commemorate the 2021 International Women's Day. On behalf of the UNESCO International Institute for Higher Education in Latin America and the Caribbean, and of the Network for International Policies and Cooperation in Education and Training, NORAC, we thank you for joining in this webinar. Before starting today's program, we invite the panelists to keep their microphones off when not participating. We take also the opportunity to announce that this event has simultaneous translations to Spanish. Si necesita traducción al español, por favor, activar el botón en el menú inferior para español. We also remind you that this event will be recorded and later released on the UNESCO ESALC YouTube channel. We will start with welcoming words by Stefania Giannini, UNESCO Assistant Director General for Education since May 2018, when she became the top UN official in the field. In this position, she provides strategic vision and leadership for UNESCO in coordinating and monitoring the implementation of the Education 2030 Agenda, encapsulated in Sustainable Development Goals 4. With an academic background in the humanities, Mrs. Giannini has served as rector of the University for Foreigners of Perugia, being one of the first and youngest women to hold this position in Italy as Senator of the Republic of Italy and Minister of Education, Universities and Research. She developed and implemented a structural, structural reform of the Italian education system, centered on social inclusion and cultural awareness. She has also been closely involved in an advisory capacity with the European Commissioner for Research and Innovation, over to you, Mrs. Uh, Giannini. We will now show uh, a video, a welcoming video. Ladies and gentlemen, happy International Women's Day. The day has been uh, celebrated around the team of women in leadership, achieving an equal future in a covenant in the world. Leadership, education, and societal change are closely connected. This is why I'm so pleased to join the launch of this new report entitled Women in Higher Education Has the Female Advantage Put an End to Gender Inequalities? I thank Isaac and Norak uh, for hosting this important uh, event. Yezalk is UNESCO specialized institute uh, on higher education, contributing to the improvement of higher education globally. And the institute is such uh, is rightfully uh, placed to provide evidence and advise governments on all higher education issues. And that is precisely what this report does. It goes beyond the often discussed glass ceiling, the corporate world to focus on the situation in the higher education sector, which definitely receives less public attention. The report goes beyond the headline numbers to show persistent inequalities in higher education that affect the force to advance gender equality in our societies. Yes, in most regions, women outnumber men in tertiary education uh, enrollments, and numbers are clear on that. But this has not uh, led to more women holding key academic positions in universities. Few women are rectors, and this is a loss for institutions. Even when they become professor, women remain underpaid relative to their male counterparts. Well, the underrepresentation of women in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, uh, STEM, remains an enduring gap. This gap affects the research and development choices that are being made the future of our societies. In short, women need to be influencing the agenda if you are to overcome gender inequalities at large. Lastly, 
The report provides interesting insights into the adverse impact of the COVID-19 pandemic for women in higher education. For example, publication rates for male researchers are increasing more than those for a male researcher, a trend that could be linked to women's additional childcare and domestic responsibility during lockdown. The report warns that the pandemic uh, could reverse decades of gains made in female participation in higher education, a concern at all levels of education, at, uh, definitely. So this report, uh, it's a call for action, a very important one. It's a matter of human rights, of upholding commitments made in the Beijing Declaration in 1995 and in the current 30 agenda, in particular in uh, SDG 4 and SDG 5. Well, to conclude, I would like to challenge all higher education leaders present at this virtual conference today in this important occasion to close the gender gap in their own institutions. I hope that by sharing the report more widely, we can inspire a global dialogue and stronger actions to advance gender equality in higher education and empower women to lead as equals in all fields. Let me seize the opportunity to congratulate our colleagues at UNESCO ESL for developing this timely document and to wish you an excellent meeting. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thanks, Ms. Giannini. Next on the agenda, we will have welcoming remarks by Dr. Moira Fall, Executive Director of the Network for International Policies and Cooperation in Education and Training, NORAC, since March 2020. She was Deputy Director of the Public-Private Partnership Center at the University of Geneva and was also visiting professor at the Graduate Institute in 2019. Originally from Zimbabwe, Moira brings substantial expertise in education and international cooperation, as well as in organizational development and management in the private and voluntary sectors in China, Spain, Switzerland, and the UK. She holds a PhD from the University of Cambridge and a teaching qualification from the University of Oxford. She has published widely on education and international cooperation. She has produced studies for international organizations, including the Global Partnership for Education, the UK government, UNESCO, OLAYA, and Action Aid. Over to you, Dr. Moira Ford. Thank you very much, Sarah. And thank you to UNESCO IESALC for giving us this opportunity to partner with you at the launch of this incredibly important report on International Women's Day. And NORAG itself um, is just a little bit younger than me. Um, and it's our strength really lies in addressing under-researched questions of quality and equity in key issues in education and development, and in amplifying underrepresented expertise, particularly from the South. So you can imagine just how pleased we are to be partnering with UNESCO IESELC on this particular project. If you would like to become a member of our network, you'll find the link in the chat. Now, this is um, such an important, timely and fascinating report which gives us a really clear window into what it means to be working and studying as a woman in higher education. In addition to these numbers and macro level data, we do need to also bear in mind the individual experiences that underneath those. So before our UNESCO ISL colleagues present their important analyses, I'd like to take this opportunity to take a few moments to tell one of the many personal stories behind the numbers that they are sharing with us today. And the story for me starts with my grandmother, who was born in 1899, who stood up to my grandfather in order to ensure that my mother got 
her education that she went to high school and then she went on to teach a training college. My mother, pictured here, if I can get my screen to move forward, my mother who is pictured here at the back with my grandfather and grandmother, three of my sisters and four of my cousins, then supported me to become the first person and the first woman in my family to even go on to postgraduate studies. So the nice summary that Sara gave us there about my teacher training college, my master's, my PhD is fundamentally down to those two women at the back of this photograph. And even with that support, my route through what tends to be sold in the narrative of education as a straight path from primary school, secondary school, college, higher education, my path actually follows the path of many minoritized people, women, people of color, people from the South, first generation, higher education, lower social economic status, and also the intersections between all of this makes it much, much worse. So I left higher education after my first degree, went to work, saved back, came back in, left to work, then applied to come back into a PhD, was accepted onto four PhD programs in two years, but I had to wait in order to be offered a scholarship in order to be able to take one of those programs up with a large amount of support from my partner, which is also not always the case. And then to find myself in exactly the situation that we will soon hear being described in this report. These slow gains, and they're still too slow, if at all, which are being lost again in the past year or so, it appears, through the way women's responsibilities are being constructed during these times of pandemics. And so this International Women's Day, we honor all of the women and the men and the sacrifices they made and the support that they gave to get us to this point. And we will listen to these findings in their spirit to continue this progress and to recuperate the losses that we have experienced this past year. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Fall, uh, for sharing uh, your personal stories with all of us. Today's program will continue with the launching of UNESCO YESAT report, followed by an open dialogue with specialists that will share relevant information regarding women in higher education in the regions of expertise in three rounds of questions as follows. What is the current status of women's participation in higher education? What policies uh, in the region seem to work? And what prospects uh, for the future uh, do they see, uh, particularly looking at the sustainable development goals of the 2030 agenda? After the dialogue, um, the audience is welcome to submit questions to the Zoom chat. Today's event will be closed with final conclusions by Carolyn Medel Anonuevo, head of the education unit of the UNESCO Regional Office for Southern Africa, and final with the remarks by Dr. Frances Pedro, UNESCO DSL director. We also count on the participation of visual, of visual translator Flan Salomon, who will translate the information of this meeting into diagrams that we will share uh, before leaving the room. We now proceed to the official launching of the report, Women in Higher Education, Has the Female Advantage Put an End to Gender Inequalities by Daniel Vieira, UNESCO YESAUT Research Coordinator. Daniel holds a PhD in Social Sciences from the University of Hamburg, Germany. She was a program specialist for the education sector at UNESCO and is currently a policy analyst at UNESCO YESAD. Previous work experience includes the University of California, the UN Climate Change Secretariat and the Cluster of Excellent CLISAP in Germany. Over to you, Danielle Vieira. Hi, thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much for this introduction. Um, I would like to greet 
the authorities and also the colleagues who are joining us today in this um, important panel, including our colleagues from NORAC who are um, co-organizing this panel today in celebration of the International Women's Day. I will be presenting some um, key messages and some of the results that we have um, acquired with this um, recently uh, work that we developed um, on the aspect of the women participation in higher education. And for that, I'm gonna be sharing here a small presentation with you. Um, and I think, I hope everyone can see it now. If not, Sarah, could you just please confirm that my screen is um, well placed so I can please proceed? Yes, 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 we can Thank see you. it. Danny. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. So as I said, we have recently, um, um, we are launching today a, a recent study that we have developed in the aspect of women in higher education to understand the participation of women and the inequalities that they uh, unfortunately still face in this important sector. So we are launching this today, of course, in celebration of the International Women's Day as part of the celebrations, but also for us to have in mind what are the um, key obstacles that we still face when we look into the higher education system. Um, so this is the report, which is um, available, will be available in all our um, um, web pages and the UNESCO related publication web pages. Um, and we had uh, three main objectives with this um, report. The first one, we wanted to understand the situation of the women participation in higher education, because often we have studies and analysis that understand or, or, or analyze the gender disparities when we look into the corporate world, but we wanted to understand a bit more look into the higher education sector. So it was the first, this was the first objective that we had. Identify, of course, some um, inequalities that the women still face when we look into the sector and provide some policy recommendations, particularly taking into consideration that we want to continue advancing um, um, in women participation in higher education. So the rationale behind the development of this report was also um, uh, previously identified fact that we identified here um, as a policy team at ISALC, which was that we have now a female advantage in higher education. Um, and this is um, something positive for us to highlight here. So women's um, 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 rates in tertiary enrollment, they have increased at a higher rate than the men's um, enrollment. This is only not the reality in sub-Saharan Africa, which is the only re region where men are still um, um, overrepresented. So if you look, for example, here in this um, illustration, this is part of a study that we developed last year. So we wanted to understand the overall dynamics around access to higher education, taking the period between 2000 and 2018. And among the various factors that we found out during this study, one factor that, um, one element that caught our attention was the fact that the females um, um, enrollment in higher education have increased significantly. When we look from 2000 to 2019, we have an increase from 19% to 41%. So you can see that in most of the regions, the women enrollment in higher education now, when we look into the, the most recent data, is higher than the men. So we have a female advantage when we look into the higher education enrollment. This is very positive, of course. But then um, when we look a little bit in more detail around these dynamics, what we found out is that there are still some limits of this advantage. What we mean here is that there are some persisting inequalities in their participation. So although they are entering more the higher education system, we still have or, or face some obstacles, um, some persisting inequalities. So the first one that we would like to highlight with you refers to STEM. And I think this is a very well-known um, data globally. So what we can see here is that we still face a horizontal gender segregation. So women are underrepresented when we look into the STEM careers. STEM, we mean here science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, right? And this has nothing to do with capacity or performance, right? These differences are a matter of other factors, for example, cultural bias, the understanding that some careers um, are, are careers for, for men instead of, of being careers for women. So this is the first um, inequality that we have identified. And globally, um, in over two thirds of the countries, what we see is that the females studying STEM or ICT, for example, is below 25%. So this is the first um, I mean, inequality that we would like to highlight. 
The second one, which is also important, refers to the vertical segregation. So we are talking about here the postgraduate degrees. And what we see is that although there are more women taking bachelor and master's degrees um, 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 in terms of enrollment, of course, there are regional differences, but although they are overrepresented in these um, two specific degrees enrollment, they are underrepresented in PhD enrollment. And this has a very important impact when we look, for example, to their career for those women who want to follow career, for example, in academia, as this is a very, um, this is a necessary step for them to follow academic career or even further achieving advanced um, 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 career levels, even outside the, the, the higher education sector. So this is the first persisting inequality that we have identified, which refers to the postgraduate degrees um, 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 scenario, the vertical segregation. And at the doctoral level, um, from the last data that we have, we have 44% of, of the share of female graduates um, um, worldwide. So let's also have this in mind because um, soon we are going to see the differences in, um, um, in the professor rates. And of course, this is very much related to this data here. Another um, inequality that we have identified refers to the research performance, right? So overall, we also identified that there are more male than female researchers, right? Um, only 30% of the world's researchers at universities are women, right? So um, what we see is that men, they are publishing more than women. And here you can see, um, you can see um, in front of your screen is an illustration that shows this very well. Of course, we have achieved, um, by we, I mean the women have achieved better um, um, rates in terms of publications. Uh, but it's still, it's significantly lower than, um, than the publications of our male colleagues. And this gap has even increased during the pandemic. I'm going to come back to this um, 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 data very soon when we talk about the, the, the pandemic COVID-19 scenario. So let's also have in mind, right? So we have inequalities in STEM studies, um, in um, postgraduate degrees, in research performance, also in the professional rate, right? As I said, that there are less women achieving the PhD degrees. Of course, this has an impact on their um, teaching positions as, as a teaching staff in tertiary education. Often you have to, to, at least for the higher levels, you have to have, uh, you need to have a PhD degree. So women are underrepresented among these teaching staff in tertiary education. Similar to what happened with the postgraduate degrees, they are here also overrepresented with the teaching staff in primary and secondary um, education. So this illustration here in front of you, you can you can see it very well what I, what I mean, right? So we have like, from data from 2018, we have women representing 43% um, of the teachers um, um, or lecturers in tertiary education compared to 66% um, in uh, primary education or 54% in secondary education. So one conclusion that we can have here is that the upper we go, the higher we, low we go in terms of positions, the less women um, um, we have. I don't want also just to, to bring here only negative uh, um, data. I think it's very important that we take into account that overall, the, the uh, position, the, the share of women in tertiary education teaching positions has increased in, in all regions, except from, from Sub-Saharan Africa. So when, when we take a historical perspective, it has been improving, but still we are underrepresented um, in teaching positions in the tertiary education and higher education institutions overall. So this is another inequality that we have identified as part of the report. There is also um, this one, which I also would like to highlight here, which refers to senior management positions, right? So um, we also um, have identified that there are less women taking leadership positions within the, the higher education system. So here we mean rectors, we mean um, senior administrative staff, we mean uh, taking part in executive bodies or, or research bodies inside those institutions. So similar to what happened in the corporate world, also in the higher education systems, we have less women in these um, senior management positions. And to finalize, um, it's also important to highlight the inequalities or the differences in terms of salary or wage gap, right? So what we identified here is that we have the same degree often, but a lower salary. 
right? So this is also partly explained by the um, horizontal um, gender segregation because many well um, paid um, positions, they are um, related, for example, to the STEM careers where we have a less participation of women. But of course, as our ADG highlighted in her um, speech in the beginning of our uh, meeting, we also have the aspect of parenthood impacts, right? Which often have a, a, a bigger impact in the career of women, of, of mothers, than in the career of fathers. So this is a couple, um, these are a couple of inequalities that we have identified, as I said, research, postgraduate degrees, um, STEM careers, research performance, um, wage gap, which still persists, unfortunately, when we look into the um, um, higher education um, system. Also, um, you have one minute left. Thank you. I'm just reaching the end of the presentation. Okay. Uh, we just wanted to highlight also the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, right? This, all this data is very detailed in the, in the report. But here, you, what we wanted to highlight here that overall, the, the, we have more submitted um, um, manuscripts um, or ac research activities overall for both genders, but the submission of female researchers has accelerated less or slower than those by male researchers and during the, the first um, um, period of the, of the pandemic. So this is something that we also have to take into consideration. Just to finalize my presentation, we have um, included a couple of recommendations in the, in the report, which you can, of course, see it online. So we have, of course, um, suggested the um, enhanced of uh, female participation in these traditionally male-dominated careers, more diversity policies um, that take into consideration um, 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 these aspects. We need more data, more um, collect data, not only by governments, but also by universities. Um, it's very important that we have, for example, mentoring or empowerment um, um, programs in terms of leadership positions. So we um, enforce um, um, these positions for, for our female colleagues. And it's also important to highlight here first the aspect of um, that we would it would be necessary to have better transparency policies in terms of the payment, right? The differences in payment, as we said, it's not necessarily related to academic background. We have identified that even for the same degrees, we have different um, payments. So it would be we would benefit from better uh, pay transparency policies within these these systems. Of course, we have um, more recommendations in the report. We welcome everybody to um, have a look in the material which we have online. And with that, I finish um, my presentation and would like to thank very much everybody for their attention. Um, thank you, Sarah, I will go back to you. Uh, thanks, Daniele, uh, for the presentation of the report. Um, we now proceed to open the dialogue. Uh, in the meantime, I would like to ask uh, uh, the audience to submit uh, their questions uh, through the Q&A chat. Uh, in order to have them ready for the end of the of the panel. Um, so to start with the with the dialogue, we welcome uh, Dr. Wurhian Chloe Sim, researcher at the Waseda University Faculty of Education and Integrated Arts in Sci and Sciences in Tokyo, where she completed her PhD degree in education with a dissertation entitled "What is Higher Education for." Educational Aspirations and Career Prospects of Women in the Arab World that investigates the social aspects of higher education in the Arab states of the Gulf and the attitudes and aspirations of young women towards higher, higher education. She holds a Master's of Education and a Bachelor's of Education degree in Sociology of Education from Waseda University. By engaging with methodologies her teaching and research interests center on higher education, its social function in society, and the educational phenomena in the Arab Gulf, and extends into topics on education, consciousness, and behavior, and the role of gender in educational decision making. Dr. Wihian Cloesin, we would like to ask you the first question uh, of this first round. And that is, what is the current status of the participation of women in higher education as students, faculty or managers in the Arab Gulf states and where do gender-based inequalities persist? You will have five minutes to respond. 
Dr. Sin, the floor is yours. Thank you for a kind introduction and good afternoon, everyone. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this insightful international discussion on International Women's Day. I'm excited, uh, I'm excited to be here and speak with you all today. Uh, as for the Gulf countries, I mean, for Gulf countries, I'll say the educational phenomena shown in the case of six Arab Gulf countries, that is uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Qatar, uh, Oman, Kuwait, and Bahrain are in line with the global trend that the report pointed out. Women comprise the majority of student bodies in higher education institutions at all levels in most fields of study. Since 2000, the majority of university students have, had, have been female. For example, uh, Kuwait, Qatar, and the UAE had female enrollment ra rate at roughly 70% and Bahrain at 65% while Saudi Arabia and Oman have lowest female enrollments uh, among the six Gulf countries, but they still had a female majority. Given that women were dis disadvantaged by unequal access to higher education until the late 1990s, the female student body in the Gulf has increased sharply over the last two decades, and it and it is now widely agreed that Arab Gulf women have made phenomenal advancement in education, as witnessed in the exponential uh, exponential rise in the uh, number of women accessing higher education to attain graduate and postgraduate degrees. However, uh, the role of faculty and managers by no means parallel that of the student body. For example, Qatar has more than 70% female en enrollment in the student body, whereas 50% of its faculty are female. However, I would still say higher education is one area of employment where our Gulf women have made considerable progress. Some have been broken uh, through the grass ceiling into higher education leadership. As for the background, there has been an ongoing demand for females uh, in faculty and managerial role at women's universities and women's colleges, uh, women's campuses due to the gender segregated education system. Moreover, uh, due to this institutional context, it can be said that the Arab Gulf women have crossed stereotype boundaries in education even earlier than in other industries. Moreover, uh, over the last decade, in line with the last two of the world, uh, the Gulf countries have promoted women's inclusion in senior and board positions in, the mo in most industries and higher education is no exception. This trend is not only limited to women's only institutions as evidenced by the, uh, the appointment of the first female president to head a co-education uh, public university in Saudi Arabia last year. Of course, uh, the shadow of gender inequality has not completely vanished. Uh, within women's universities and women's campuses, women are present at the senior level, uh, senior faculty level, and in higher education decision-making bodies. Though um, there is some, uh, though, but uh, the government and administrative leaders remain mostly men. So in summation, though there is some scope to better improve uh, women's representation in educational uh, leadership position, it can be said that women's participation in higher education in the six Arab Gulf countries is making a probable process. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sin, uh, for your answer. Uh, we would like to now uh, welcome our next panelist uh, and uh, 
we let us welcome Dr. Rekha Papu, professor and chairperson of the Asim Premdi School of Education at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences in India. As a researcher, teacher, and consultant, she has been working for over two decades with institutions in the academic and the development sectors. Her research and teaching interests are in the areas of education, gender, and development. She has published in these areas in academic journals as well as in newspapers and magazines. She is also the editor in chief of the Handbook of Education Systems in South Asia, a Springer major reference work, which is to be released in a few months. Dr. Reka Papu, what is the current statute? of the participation of women in higher education as students, faculty, or managers in South Asia, and where do gender-based inequalities persist? Please remember that you have only five minutes to respond. Dr. Papu, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sarah, for the introduction. And thank you also to uh, UNESCO and to NORAC for inviting me to this uh, panel where uh, report on this extremely important subject is being launched. Uh, and greetings to all on the International Women's Day. I'm happy to be here. Uh, to respond to the question that was posed uh, about the status of uh, women in higher education in South Asia, uh, I would, uh, it is rather regretful that we still haven't uh, achieved the female advantage that the report has spoken about. Though the increase in participation rates of women in higher education is quite phenomenal, especially if you consider that till quite recently, uh, even up until uh, mid 20th century, uh, women's education was regarded as taboo. And from there, uh, we have reached a situation, and this is true of uh, almost all the countries of South Asia, I'm referring to uh, the Handbook of Education Systems in South Asia, for which I'm the editor-in-chief and which Sarah mentioned. The countries include uh, uh, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, uh, Maldives, Mauritius, Myanmar, uh, Nepal, India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. Uh, the slight difference, we've got 10 countries instead of the conventional uh, eight countries, and we go into the details of that. But I'm uh, speaking about these 10 countries of South Asia. The average uh, gross enrollment ratio is at about 24%. And uh, of course, this 24% gross enrollment ratio of women in higher education, uh, I mean, there is wide disparities among if you look at the country level statistics, there's wide disparity with uh, Afghanistan, and this is UIS estimation that the uh, GER is uh, four, five percent, and uh, Pakistan it's about eight point seven percent. The higher side of the GER would be in India, where it's about twenty-two point eight. Uh, Sri Lanka has got about uh, similar figures. Uh, Maldives and this statistic is different from uh, what the report has is about 47% and uh, Mauritius too has a high percent which is about 58%. So even with these kinds of statistics, what these statistics probably mask is that and their country level statistics, what they probably mask is that there is huge underrepresentation in higher education for girls from uh, marginalized backgrounds in, in terms of race, in terms of, sorry, in terms of class, in terms of caste, uh, the tribe, religious communities. That is, uh, the uh, underrepresentation of girls from these communities is quite huge. So this would be one part of it. Uh, so on the whole, participation rates have increased. Uh, but as uh, has been pointed out by the report, the participation of girls in higher education is clustered in certain kinds of disciplines, and there is underrepresentation in uh, STEM subjects. And we are speaking here of largely uh, the enrollment figures and not the completion figures. So if you look at the complete, I mean, we do not have statistics on the completion figures. We have them for primary education, upper uh, lower secondary, upper secondary, but not for higher education. So this is something that I would want to park. Uh, and as pointed out by the report, and probably this would be true for many regions as well, there is the uh, 
I mean, women are hugely underrepresented in faculty positions and more so in leadership positions, right? So this is uh, true. This gender gap is uh, especially pronounced in institutions of eminence. For instance, if you looked at India, we have the Institution of Excellence, uh, the Indian Institute of Technology. Uh, women faculty here are uh, less than 10%, I mean, they are less than 10% the overall faculty strength. Uh, there's also data and studies coming in from Afghanistan, which have shown that large generations of women who would want to go in for religious education are not allowed to do so because of a uh, cultural, uh, 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 what do you say, cultural uh, requirement that girls be taught only by women. And because the school at schooling level and higher levels, there are no uh, female teachers, this generation, so it's, uh, this kind of education is lost for uh, quite a few generations of young women. So there is this part. And in terms of the status, uh, if you're looking at education, uh, gender equity uh, in education. Have, excuse me. You have one yes. minute left. I'm sorry. Sure. Not at all. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to draw attention also to the fact that we're speaking about gender equity in education. Um, one of the four things that Nellie Stromquist's uh, theoretical framework points to is uh, access, completion, quality learning, and recognition, which goes beyond uh, the educational system. And at this, uh, I, I'll probably come back to this point, but South Asia is um, rather unique in the fact that there's a negative relationship between employment and education. And in fact, uh, various studies have shown that uh, there is, have confirmed the U pattern or the U golden U curve, which show that uh, it is the poor women at one end and the rich women at another end who are uh, part of the, who are uh, employed or who seek employment and are in or are in employment. In fact, a study that was taken up by uh, University of Sussex showed that the survey showed that there was a great deal of reluctance among women in South Asia to aspire towards uh, senior positions within the academy as well. And we will need to look into these uh, aspects again. So I'll stop here and come back uh, later if there are Thank questions. you. Thank you, Dr. Papu, for your answer. Let us now welcome uh, Ms. Anteres Don Yata. Um, Anteres is the director of the UNESCO Multisectoral Regional Office in Eastern Africa. She joined UNESCO in 2004 as director of the Division of Basic Education in the education sector, where she was responsible for policy development, research, and convening of experts on basic education uh, related issues, literacy, and early childhood development. In 2008, Ms. Don Yata was appointed with promotion to the post of director of the UNESCO Regional Bureau for Education in Africa in Dakar, Senegal, transformed in 2013 to the UNESCO Multisectoral multi Regional Office for West Africa within the context of the reform of the field network in Africa, and UNESCO representative to Senegal, Burkina Faso, Cape Verde, Gambia, Guinea-Bissau, and Niger. She was also the Minister of Education in her country, Gambia, before she joined UNESCO. Ms. Donjata, what is the current status of the participation of women in higher education as students, faculty, or managers in Africa? And where do gender-based inequalities persist? Please remember that you will have five minutes to respond. Over to you, Ms. Donjata. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and uh, let me also join um, the other panelists in appreciating um, this very um, timely uh, study um, that has exposed um, some of the realities that we are all aware of. Uh, probably as um, has been indicated, it's a question of um, uh, some improvement, slow as it may be. Now in Africa, as it has been um, rightly indicated, um, we have seen growth in enrollment, yes, or the female uh, gender. Um, however, um, when, it, when, when we consider 
the rate is still very low. Um, it's in the region of uh, less than 1.5%, 1.04%. In, in um, real numbers, yes, it seems to appear uh, a good increase from 2.6 in in 2, million in 2000 and has reached something like 8.3 million in 2019. Uh, however, when we look at the gross enrollment um, in 2019, it's been 9.18 percent and um, it's gradually uh, um, getting better based on um, the UIS um, data. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has always had its own uh, challenges, and I like um, the presentation because beyond the numbers, what are we really beginning uh, to understand? And here, um, there are a few uh, cases where we have seen parity index uh, favorable for females, in that's Cap Verde, uh, Mauritius. I, I heard Mauritius has already been captured. Uh, seashells. And these are three essentially um, small island states. So probably there is something uh, to really take note of in that. But again, in South Africa also, we have seen uh, parity, parity index in favor of females. And um, uh, in terms of uh, the gender parity index in higher education, just like the studies have shown in Africa, um, Yes, we have an increase, but there is a, a decrease when you look at um, postgraduate studies. Now, what do we take from this and how do we really begin to understand this? Because um, much as we look at the data, we have to look at disparities at the national level and capture where you really have a serious inequities. Uh, much as this would be coming up in, the, in subsequent questions, in the, in the present situation, there is a real uh, difficulties, a real challenge uh, beyond um, most of the adherence to um, global and uh, continental discourse on uh, giving greater access to female. It seems to remain, uh, but um, uh, what one would say, uh, lip service, lip service paid by government uh, to most of these um, uh, uh, call for increase in um, support to enhance gender inequalities. And um, the very question that the, that the study has really touched upon and raised is so very pertinent in Africa. Even where we talk about access, have we been able to realize um, any serious impact as a result of the increase in access? Or is it something that um, continued uh, to be veiled by cultural issues, uh, probably societal issues? And um, my question really is that uh, the data need to be for the mind uh, to understand where, what really the story is behind the inequalities. Why does it seem to persist um, over decades? And where do we really have to make the improvements? And so far, uh, as has been indicated by the study, there isn't much that one can uh, say uh, at this point in time, except that, yes, we have gender inequalities is persistent. Um, and uh, in a few countries, uh, we, we've seen uh, uh, something that's a bit diff different, uh, but then there are explanations that one can give. Um, women continue to be underrepresented, um, especially after primary education. And in, the, in higher education, it, it continues to be very, 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 uh, very low. And um, in some countries, we've seen some improvement, but not so much when you begin to look at um, the disciplines the, where you find more women is mostly in the arts, and in science, uh, there is need, uh, especially in the STEM area, there is need to be um, a further um, encouragement, support. And uh, what are the reasons? Do we still have to tackle issues of uh, role stereotyping? Uh, and uh, do we really need to go more into sensitization 
But uh, as far as Sub-Saharan Africa is concerned, for the majority of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, the, the issues are still very real, whether you talk about policy, whether you talk about um, uh, budget, budget allocation, where, whether it is in a question of attitudes, uh, there is more to it and uh, more needs to be done. Um, let me leave it at that because um, I simply just want to concur with the, 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 the results of the study. And uh, my interest is more in looking at um, what can be done about uh, the data that we seem to have uh, received from the study from UIS and we seem to have persisted over time and not really getting much better except for small um, you know, improvements here and there. The change is not impacting on the quality of life, uh, on development and uh, the female gender continues to be disadvantaged. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Donjata. Um, let us now welcome Jose Antonio Quinteiro, UNESCO ESAL Programs Coordinator for <clears throat> Latin America and the Caribbean. He holds a bachelor's degree in library science and one in law, both from the Central University of Venezuela. He also holds a postgraduate degree in information services management from the Simón Bolívar University in a master's degree in business administration from the University of Sheffield. He's currently pursuing a diploma in public policy and education at UNESCO's International Institute for Educational Planning. His main lines of research are cross-border academic mobility, human rights, and their protection, very particularly the right to education on the, under the purview of international and customary law. Jose Antonio, what is the current status of the participation of women in higher education in Latin America and the Caribbean? And where do gender-based inequalities persist? Please remember that you will have five minutes to respond. Over to you, Jose Antonio. Thank you, Sara. Um, well, my greetings to all of you for accompanying us in our today's webinar framed with his, um, within a new celebration of the International Women's Day. Regarding this first query, it must be said that our region ranks better in comparison with other geographic blocks. However, there are still many gender-based inequalities in our Latin American region. Let's start by saying that the percentage of women in Latin American higher education is 55%, as you can see from the slide. And this is why we refer to this phenomenon as the feminization of tertiary education enrollment. However, you should also notice that this percentage starts dropping or decreasing as we enter into higher hierarchical levels within the academia. For example, as you can see, we found only 36% of female professors and only 18% of rectors or female chancellors. So with these figures in the hand, uh, alarms, uh, alarm bells go off. If we step into the research area, which, as you know, is mostly undertaken in our universities, we found hierarchical levels within the academia of women. Definitely, we are making progress um, towards a uh, gender part of writers or female chastity uh, in search compared to previous decades. But women still lag behind men in number of publications and sites. If we step into the research patients, this page, which, as you know, is uh, mostly undertaken initially in the same areas, and look at the female chancellors. So, we can be particularly the case of Mexico. As you can see uh, from this uh, slide, Mexico accounts for about 300 and 53 scientific articles 
uh, produced by a man, while only 30 were produced by male authors. This reality is uh, due to researchers, uh, women, uh, to the fact that they are still very far from reaching gender pretty in that way and STEAM career. Definitely, definitely, we have a slide. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, you can see uh, here that only a number of 37 of every 100 uh, uh, graduates in Mexico and uh, are behind men in number of publications and in the area of uh, STEAM careers, I mean, science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics, only 32 in Honduras. And only 18 women uh, from this uh, satellite, Mexico accounts for about 300 men out of every 10 graduates in Chile. However, uh, if we see uh, this new slide, um, you will find only 13 that um, that uh, produce, which is a primarily primarily uh, occupied by women. Uh, the number publications and citations uh, reported by El Sevier Poblenci House for the year 2014-2018, we will see that most of the women, uh, the, uh, the authors are publishing being cited. This fact reveals that there are still pervasive studies Providing in our society that define from this new slide, um, which are masculine or feminine oriented uh, um, and domain. So, uh, in general terms, we make that we need much more women in science, we need much more women in STEM careers, and we need much more women in uh, senior levels uh, within um, the academia. But you uh, Hi, uh, thank you, Jose Antonio. We now proceed to the second round of questions and would like to invite Dr. Wuhan Cloesim to share with the audience what policies either at national or institutional level seem to work in her region of expertise, the Arab Gulf states. Dr. Sim, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, to respond to the question, I would say both in uh, both national and institutional policies have worked well. The Gulf states are pursuing a transition from oil-based economies to more knowledge-based economies to create a sustainable and stable future economic structure. Needless to say, uh, securing human capital has become a top priority in the development strategy of all six Gulf countries. Higher education plays a crucial role in economic development as tertiary education can lead an accelerated path of skilled employment and economic growth. The Gulf countries have already uh, come a long way in expanding their respective higher education sectors by encouraging the younger generation to pursue higher education and investing in the expansion of higher education institutions. Uh, for instance, many of these countries did not have formal higher education institutions three decades ago, but now many of them are home to several dozen universities. Moreover, uh, since the oil-rich uh, Gulf governments tend to heavily subsidize higher education for their citizens, Gulf citizens have little to no financial oblig obligations uh, when pursuing higher, ed higher education at all levels. In case of Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, students even receive monthly subsidies and scholarships. Uh, there is no doubt that these policies have served to increase women's enrollments in higher education institutions. Moreover, 
uh, it is uh, worth noting the importance of the social and communal recognition and awareness uh, conferred upon women who attain higher education. In the case of the art of reason, high social recognition is being cast upon those with advanced degree aside from their potential economic uh, attainment. For instance, Women with uh, advanced academic degree are called doctora, which means doctor in Arabic feminine form, not only in the workplace, but even in their everyday lives, which indicate a high level of social praise and regard. Thus, it should be not overlooked that this social atmosphere has had a positive effect on motivating the dramatic increase of women in higher education. Uh, thus, in the case of countries where women participate less in advanced level of higher education, despite of the active implementation of policies aimed at increasing women's participation in higher education, I'll stress the necessity of taking a closer look at the social and regional uh, context to see how highly educated women are recognized and evaluated in, in their respective societies. Uh, one, uh, on the other hand, for the Gulf countries, given that women are already uh, the majority of students in higher education, I think the focus should be not risked so heavily on increasing the number of women in higher education and gaining more equal access to every field uh, of higher education. Rather, uh, focus should be made on opening up new and diverse opportunities for women after they have completed the stepping stones of higher education. It is in transition from higher education to stable and equitable uh, careers that women could most benefit from government policies and institutional support. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Um, we now would like to ask uh, this question to Dr. Reka Papu. What policies either at national or institutional level seem to work in South Asia? Over to you, Dr. Papu. Thank you. Uh, as the previous panelists mentioned, the decision to expand higher educational institutions has played a very important role in, the pres in uh, attracting more women students, mainly because issues of uh, access, as in geographical access, how close to their residence uh, higher educational institutions are considerations of these kinds, along with uh, whether or not the higher educational institutions have residential facilities such as hostels. These were the kinds of considerations. And uh, most of the uh, South Asian countries, the number of colleges, universities, has, there has been a growth in relation to this, which has also led to uh, more numbers of girl students uh, joining the higher education institutions. Uh, the, the fact that uh, the governments of all these South Asian countries have committed themselves to providing uh, schooling elementary education I, has also contributed to the fact that these girls uh, are now going on into uh, colleges and universities. There's almost 100% enrollment and completion of schooling and higher secondary education in uh, almost all the South Asian countries, countries like Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, the completion rates are still low, but uh, otherwise most of the South Asian countries have seen that uh, all there is universal elementary education and post second, the secondary stage is one of the barriers for most girls. If they are able to complete secondary education, studies have shown that uh, their ambitions, their aspirations, as well as support from the family has been forthcoming for them to go into higher educational institutions. And here the governments have uh, in fact taken proactive steps to ensure uh, kind of cultural acceptance for girls' education uh, into higher levels. Uh, I must mention too that uh, there is another cultural factor which has, uh, it's not, I mean, the same as uh, state policy, but 
uh, the larger socio-cultural uh, environment is an important factor. There is an acceptance, growing acceptance of uh, women in higher education, uh, largely because there's also a notional sense of what that uh, there is a certain desirable level at, of education which will enable women to get married. In most of the South Asian countries, they, there is the notion of the arranged marriage. This is a, a reality. And here, educational levels also seem to feed into what the requirements are for matrimonial considerations. And this change is varied, of course, varies from country to country. Uh, for instance, uh, in a country like uh, India, where earlier it was the bachelors, it's moving to the masters now for certain communities. Uh, but there is, uh, I mean, the families speak about educating their daughters in terms of returns, uh, but also in terms of respectability. What are the kinds of returns that families will get uh, if they educate their daughters and also in terms of uh, the honor of the family, whether there is any risk of that particular respectability being lost. So this is on the sociocultural side, but in relation to state policies, uh, most of the countries again have brought in kind of laws to prevent uh, sexual harassment at workplace, which has applied also to higher educational institutions. These haven't necessarily worked very well, but they have to a certain extent built confidence uh, among students uh, and uh, that too has been one of the factors not a major one, but it has helped, I would say. The biggest factor, of course, is whenever there are scholarships uh, available for female students, economic support, both coming for, uh, from the state for their education. One has also seen that uh, enrollment and uh, completion within higher educational institutions is much higher than uh, in other times. There's also been Thank you. Oh, yeah. Sorry. You you uh, have no. You have uh, uh, you you still have uh, uh, thirty seconds. Half a minute. So okay. May. Yeah. So I just wanted to mention that the fact that uh, there have been curriculum reforms as well as uh, in-service and free-service trainings for teachers in relation and creating gender awareness. Most of these factors too have had their own uh, role to play. In increasing participation of women in higher education. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Thanks, uh, Dr. Papu. Um, let us now uh, welcome um, Ms. Don Yata uh, with this question um, What policies, either at national or institutional level, seem to work in Africa? Uh, over to you, Ms. Don Yata. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think it's, it's an interesting uh, question. Um, when you talk about policies, I think the context is so very different listening to what's prevailing in the, in the two other regions that have been presented by the two panelists. In Africa, one could say the, there are, the policy environments seem to look as if, um, yes, uh, uh, at the national, at the institutional, um, there are, policies that favor um, uh, enrollment. There are policies that, that favor female enrollment and um, uh, progression. Uh, but in reality, um, given the, the economic situation of most countries in Africa, um, these, these are policies that are implemented only where you have, in most cases, where you have support uh, be it financial aid or loans, and uh, uh, the, the, it's, one cannot always argue that um, uh, uh, higher education, investment in higher education is a priority in most of the, the African countries. However, uh, let me quickly add that um, for economies that are doing much better as in the Southern Africa region, Eastern Africa region, we, we're beginning to see um, policies that are being implemented to ensure that more um, female students are able to access higher education. Um, uh, but like I said, the aid dependency has really sort of um, 
giving a picture that's not so very easy to generalize. Uh, but in Southern Africa, in Northern Africa, um, parts of Eastern Africa, we have seen, um, and this was an, an issue I had didn't, I did not really um, dwell upon at length on uh, the performance of the female faculty in research. Most of the research that's coming out is really um, from these regions. In Western and Central Africa, we haven't seen uh, the same kind of um, support from government or investment in higher education or prioritization. So it all boils down to um, implementation of these policies. I can give a few examples where we, we have seen some good um, uh, structures in place uh, that supports um, uh, higher education. Uh, for instance, at the continental level with uh, the African Union, we have uh, seen a lot of um, focus uh, on higher education and it has been the, the, the recommendation of the African Union for a very long time uh, to really ensure that we do not only uh, focus on uh, primary or secondary, but on higher education. And that gave rise to establishment of various um, higher education council, um, like, like the one we have in Eastern Africa, Southern Africa, uh, to some extent, um, West Africa, but it is more uh, at the level of ECOWAS uh, trying to really ensure that governments adhere to policies uh, that uh, provide equal opportunity. Uh, but, and this is where the, the real challenge is. So even if you have um, the data, as we have seen, if it were disaggregated by region, we would realize that you have um, a fairer response uh, from Northern, Eastern, Southern than you would from West and Central. Uh, and a, a specific example of Eastern Africa where I serve right now is the Inter-University Council of East Africa um, and which has um, over the period received a lot of support also, um, like I said, uh, from uh, partners uh, in, in setting up the African Qualifications Framework for Higher Education. We have at the, at the level of uh, Southern Africa, um, something similar. Um, at the continental level also, we have a support for um, higher education quality assurance um, that is really um, promoted at the level of the African Union. And uh, they are also looking at um, uh, you know, quality um, uh, mechanisms uh, for higher education to begin to really adhere to in terms of um, recognition of studies, certificates, diplomas, and uh, UNESCO's convention um, has also given uh, a little bit of boost in this area in Africa, but it falls short of the expectations and the kind of framework and structures we have in other regions of the world. And uh, as, like I, I want to really underscore this because the research may not have picked this up. It may show that these are things that are happening. These are the tendencies. And rather than just focus on the what, the why is essentially because there is high dependence on, on aid uh, for investment. When you look at the, the share of the budget uh, of education that goes towards higher education, it is really um, uh, very low. And therefore, you, uh, higher education institutions uh, cannot really uh, implement some of these policies. And even where they do exist, um, it, what persists is uh, the status quo where you have a lot more male faculties uh, because uh, for the female faculties, like has been mentioned um, in, in the research, uh, there are other challenges that the female faculty um, experiences and therefore um, would not really uh, persist uh, to really higher levels of, of um, you know, studies or maybe take up important um, uh, positions given uh, some of these cultural and socioeconomic um, factors. Uh, we also have uh, what you call the African Virtual uh, University. Miss uh, Dondiata. Yeah, okay, let me very you have 30 seconds. Uh -huh. Yeah, let me round Thanks. up there and say that at the, at, the, at the national level as well, you do have situations of um, um, policies uh, that are enacted and this 
happens across uh, the continent, but whether it's implemented is the issue. And uh, let me leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Onyata. Um, now we keep the floor to Jose Antonio Quintero. Uh, uh, Jose Antonio, what policies either at national or institutional level seem to work in Latin America and the Caribbean? Over to you. Uh, thank you, Sara. Um, first of all, I would like you to confirm that you are listening to me quite well because my technician told me that um, my my previous intervention, the sound was intercut. Could you please confirm? Now it sounds good. We can hear you. Okay. Do you want to try again? Uh huh. Uh, yes. Let me try to um, portray this uh, presentation the way it should be portrayed. Just a second. Well, it doesn't seem to work. Well, let's forget it. As I previously, as I previously said, um, the number of uh, Latin American women enrolled in higher education and working in research is markedly higher than the world standard. Thus, many of the actions are the, taken by higher education institutions in Latin America are mainly focused on introducing policies to reduce gender-based sexual violence as a region exhibits one, one of the highest rates. Persistent gender inequalities in STEAM, and I have already talked about that, has been, um, has been long recognized. However, initiatives such as coding clubs and boot camps that promote the participation of girls in STEAM are still few in our region. And what prevails is more related to attraction campaigns into scientific areas in secondary school. We also have found uh, that some countries in our region, Argentina, Uruguay, for example, have adopted the UNESCO Saga methodology in order to ensure uh, equality in science, technology, and innovation in their national uh, strategies and, and, and plans. Uh, an example of this is um, the project Mas Mujeres en Ciencias that is directed uh, or is under the lead uh, of the Ministry of Education and Culture of uh, Uruguay. Back to you, Sara. Thank you. Thank you, Jose Antonio. And uh, we would like now to have our guest speakers answer the third question. What prospect do you see for the future in your region, particularly looking at the sustainable development goals of the 2030 agenda? And we invite Dr. Chloe Sim uh, to respond the question uh, in her area of, of expertise. The floor is yours, Dr. Sim. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, regarding the future prospects of education in the Gulf, I'll draw two points. Uh, first of all, when it comes to women's education, Considering the current situation in which highly educated women are actively employed in leading roles, uh, both the women's postgraduate and graduate level en enrollments will continue to rise. Uh, this trend corresponds with her Sustainable Development Goal 5, which strive to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. Uh, in every aspect of their lives. And in case to obtain an education of which they were once uh, deprived the opportunity. 
Uh, personally, I, a phenomenon I discovered during my field work uh, that is particularly notable in relation to women in higher education is uh, the re-education of middle-aged women, many of whom are mothers pursuing higher education alongside their daughters. It is expected that women will uh, proceed with higher, higher education, not only those uh, the younger generation, but also those of their mother's generation. This uh, sharp in increase in uh, middle-aged women returning to educational institutions uh, related to SDG Goal uh, 4. To ensure uh, inclusive and equitable quality of education and promote lifelong opportunities for all, in that uh, women are pursuing education regardless of their age. And as a second, as I've touched on before, uh, the, in the Gulf countries, the higher education enrollment rates of men is significantly lower than that of women. Uh, this circumstance also touched on the goal of uh, creating equitable educational opportunities embodied by SDGs 4. As um, Leach, Dr. Uh, Natasha Leach pointed out uh, in her book and related uh, papers and reports, it can be denied that gender and education have largely concentrated their efforts on issues relating to girls. Consequently, issues of boys' educational underachievement, especially that of boys from low economic backgrounds, have been left behind. This nuance uh, demonstrates some of the intersectional uh, barriers to securing an equitable education. Thus, uh, thus, in the future, it is expected that discussion on not only gender equality, but also on uh, educational equity will become more active, including uh, this on how to embrace this Arab Gulf men into higher education. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sim. Um, before we invite our next uh, panelists, we would like to remind the audience to submit their questions to the Q&A chat. Uh, next, we would like to uh, ask Dr. Papu, uh, what prospects do you see for the future in your region, particularly looking at the sustainable development goals of the 2030 agenda? Over to you, Dr. Papu. Thank you, Sarah. Oh, it seems to me that the trends are quite contradictory. On the one hand, uh, countries of South Asia, all of them are committed to increasing the gross enrollment ratio in higher education overall. And uh, there are also certain policies, policy commitments to increase uh, women's participation in higher education. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, you have huge uh, budget cuts. There are uh, government withdrawing from supporting uh, higher educational institutions leading to privatization of higher education. Privatization is taking different forms. And as we've seen with the privatization of uh, schooling, this is going to have adverse effects for girls' education. Um, various studies have shown that uh, girls' education has got lesser priority compared to if a family has to decide on how to allocate its uh, given funds it prefers to invest in boys' education rather than girls' education. So with these kinds of uh, budgetary cuts and the privatization of higher education, I'm not sure how the countries of South Asia are actually going to reach that goal. Uh, most likely there would be enrollment. Enrollment figures would uh, somehow, one way or the other, I think one would be able to get to certain kinds of enrollment figures. But in terms of completion of the programs, in terms of the quality of learning that the girls receive or students in general receive, I'm not so optimistic on that front. Uh, for South Asia, as I mentioned earlier, and in relation to uh, the Gulf countries, the panelists talked also about the need for social recognition of education. 
Uh, now, this kind of recognition is missing both in the society as well as in academic, academic spaces. So um, the, there are conceptions, social cultural conceptions of what it is to be a female and what it is to be feminine. And this seems to override um, conceptions of what, uh, what education can bring, the kind of returns that education can bring. So they, uh, mostly it is the social construction of the feminine that shapes responses to education. And therefore you find many women um, themselves putting up barriers for or many of them do not get into employment. The priority is uh, the domestic space as in most other regions probably, but much higher in uh, South Asia. So I think what was really required is to change this kind of perception. I mean, it's a long-term um, thing, but probably it is, I, mean, I would think it is possible um, and we would need to reverse that a negative trend, a negative relation, the trend of negative relationship between education and women's employment, because it's very essential that there are educated women in different sectors who can contribute to the knowledge uh, and practices of those particular sectors with a certain kind of gender sensitivity. Yeah, so that is, it's not, uh, I mean, the broad spirit of SDGs is what I was addressing rather than the specifics. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Papu. Uh, let us now um, give the floor to Ms. Don Yata with the same question. What prospects do you see for the future in Africa, particularly looking at the sustainable development goals of the 2030 agenda? Over to you, uh, Ms. Don Yata. Thank you very much. And um, I will really just continue from where I left off earlier, talking about um, what government's responsibility should be. But I would really want to see a future where we would have a multi-pronged approach based on all the important areas of studies that we've mentioned earlier, STEM, ICT, and looking at women's role in universities. I think um, it's about time we do not just focus on uh, what government can do, but what communities can do. And here I'm, I want to focus on the sociocultural. And has been mentioned by Moira, um, one of the reasons why Moira was able to persist and really grow is the support from the family, um, the immediate family and uh, the present um, relationship uh, that has really spurred her on. And I think in this regard, we need to do a lot more sensitization and um, allow um, the population, the citizens as well, uh, to graduate from this high dependence of, of government support, which seem not to be forthcoming, which seem not always seem uh, give priority to higher education. So we go back to the institutions themselves that are created by government and the higher education institutions to ensure that at their level, they look at uh, what the game changer would be. And I see technology as a game changer that would increase enrollment, that would also increase um, the fac faculty uh, involvement, the female faculty, and uh, probably get you in, uh, what do you call it, uh, the female um, faculties uh, to carve out an area that could support um, the mentoring aspect, just as in the, the recommendations, mentoring uh, the female gender uh, to aspire for something higher. And at the family level, and I, I can give that as an example, my own experience, where I would say it's because of the investment that my mother, um, even with the limited resources, um, initially gave uh, that got me to even persist and want to continue and later on picked up government scholarship. So I believe um, we need to look at um, policies, not only from the perspective of what governments can do, but what uh, our communities can do. And in that regard, then what the role of the woman can be would be further empowered. If we're talking to mothers, I recall at one point with FAWE, the Forum for African Women Educationalists, we were looking at mothers clubs. How can we sensitize our women? So culturally also certain cultural practices uh, don't seem to help because the stereotype continues. And uh, as we talk about the women's um, uh, role and uh, the, the kind of um, occupation, employment, opportunities for women at the level of academia and elsewhere, we may be able to get 
uh, that coming together at the community level to begin to undo certain stereotypes that give women less um, confidence to want to pursue, except for the few fortunate ones that happen to enjoy government scholarships of one sort or another, or when partners come in. So it has to be multi-pronged. And I believe it can happen because the African context um, has to be um, looked at differently. Uh, we, uh, Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, or Africa as a whole, seem to really be so dependent on aid uh, that it paralyzes governments to see the importance of investing in its human capital. And once that can really be put on a, uh, on a different trajectory, probably we would see a rise that would really give a better role to the institutions themselves and uh, to communities and culturally to begin to unpack uh, those areas for which we, we um, African uh, women tend to feel inhibited uh, to pursue. Um, I would like the example given a, a, of the Asia context where parents and it's even like recognized, it's a, it's a pride. Here in Africa, um, it, it's like frowned upon when women tend to go too far or tend to attend um, higher levels of education because uh, you will be seen as not quite uh, there or uh, uh, marketable uh, as, as a woman to get a, a, a husband. So these are some of the factors that we need to look at. And I think UNESCO uh, should have an intersectoral approach where the issues of uh, inequalities would be looked at, not only from the lens of education, but from culture, from social and human sciences, from the sciences and from communication. And together, if we are able to accompany governments, probably they'll be able to have a more holistic uh, um, uh, 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 perspective uh, to how they tackle issues of inequality, especially in higher education. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Donjata, and we would like to um, welcome uh, uh, Jose Antonio Quintero with this third question. Uh, what prospect do you see for the future in your region, in Latin America and the Caribbean, particularly looking at the sustainable development goals of the 2030 agenda? Over to you, Jose Antonio. Thank you, Sarah, once again. Well, in order to, to answer this query, I'm going to use the SDG gender index. Um, as you know, this is the most comprehensive tool available to explore the state of gender equity in 129 countries. It means that it covers 90% of women and girls in the world in alignment to 14 of the 17 SDGs. As you can see, uh, the index um, reveals or is telling us that in 2019, we had only reached 61% uh, of advancement in relation to the goals. Um, we may say that uh, the current COVID pandemic might be a reversal in this advance, uh, advancement. Uh, remember that a few days ago, the, the CEPAL, the Economic Commission for Latin America, was telling us that 22 million people fell into poverty in our region in 2020. And um, I'm going to say this in Spanish and I'm going to ask the assistance of the translators, because it's a metaphor, we usually say that in nuestra región, la pobreza tiene lamentablemente rostro de mujer. So uh, we might think that um, this uh, backdrop in the figure uh, might, be, um, might be reflected uh, very soon in some women uh, postponing uh, her entrance into higher education or canceling the, um, their aspirations to embark upon further higher education studies. Um, we have here um, 
the 2019 report that tells us um, that we have 232 indicators designed to monitor the SDGs. Although not all of them are gender related or gender sensitive, uh, this is, these indicators were telling us back in 2019 that the SDG linked to education, I mean, ODA, uh, the SDG number four, in, in 2019 was already showing a significant lag, um, uh, uh, generally speaking, globally speaking, and we uh, assume that this also applies for the Latin American region. So uh, we perceive that the pandemic uh, will be uh, an enormous um, uh, obstacle uh, in the progression of achieving um, the, the, uh, the goals that- uh, You have one minute, I'm sorry, excuse me. You have one minute, Jose Antonio. Thank you, Sara. Um, that uh, the pandemic is not contributing at all in the achievement or in in the in the continued progression of um, of um, of, uh, of achievement uh, in gender parity in globally speaking and in our region also we all we also find difficult sometimes to um, to portray the effects that um, the progression in or the effect or the um, the implications that the pandemic have in women because as you know and our colleagues in the UN has recently reported so only 60 out of 193 countries in the world are reporting data on COVID-19 uh, cases by sex and age and this is quite worrying alarm bells go off on this regard too only 60 out of 193 countries are reporting data on COVID cases by sex. And this is uh, uh, a fact that will not contribute at all in order to uh, better monitor uh, the, um, uh, the progression of the, uh, of the indicators um, that are gender related or gender sensitive uh, in our region. Back to you, Saran, thank you. Thanks, Jose Antonio. Um, let us now uh, open the uh, quest, the Q and A uh, session. And we would like um, to invite Dr. Fall for this purpose. Uh, we have a few questions from the audience uh, that we, that uh, Dr. Mora will address to our panelists today. So uh, over to you, Dr. Moira Fall. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you so much to all of the panelists for those truly inspiring and important uh, findings and presentations. So we just have 10 minutes for Q&A. So I'm going to choose um, the two questions that we've received in the chat and the Q&A that probably have the most broad um, answers. Um, but our panelists can go into the Q&A chat and also type answers to those questions if there's one that really makes you feel that you would like to um, answer it specifically for your regions or from your expertise. So, Daniele, I'm going to address the first question to you, which is really about how to increase and empower women's leadership positions in higher education. What is it that can be done in a broader policy um, uh, environment and also specifically inside higher education institutions? What can be done to improve the situation and participation of women? Hi, um, thank Daniele, you. Daniele, are you still there? Hi. I'm here, I'm here. I my camera is on, I think everyone can see me. Yep. I can you all. Yes, you're there. Um, yes, thank you, Dr. Fo, for the question. I've been checking here the QA um, um, chat, and I saw that more than one person posed this question. 
So I think the, the topic of leadership is a topic that calls attention. That is true, that we have very few women in, in higher positions. I think we have mentioned one um, possible answer to that um, in, the, um, in the report with focus on the mentoring programs, right? So the female mentoring. Um, this is a, an initiative that is a, a very common already in the corporate sector to have women mentoring, women who, who reach um, higher positions, mentoring women, um, who are willing to, to, to apply to these positions or are willing to have um, to achieve higher positions in, in their career. So we have included that in the report and I think it's, it's an important um, um, aspect to mention here. I think um, also looking to the corporate world, I think there are a couple of initiatives that they are developing in the corporate sector targeting women that we could also um, um, benchmark for the higher education system. So they have, for example, a couple of initiatives like leadership skills, um, skills for conflict management, communication skills, right? So they um, don't feel shy to, um, for example, state their opinion when in a, a male dominant um, uh, environment, for example. So these are some of the initiatives that we can see that are being um, in several um, sectors in the corporate um, um, world that, have, that are being implemented. And I think uh, we would benefit from that experience also in the in the higher education um, um, sector. I think um, if we look more into a cultural issue, I think, and we have included that in the report also, I think we need to, to, to develop um, actions to um, surpass this, this gender bias that leadership positions are only for, for, for our male colleagues, right? So that, that men are more oriented to, to, to the leadership, to the positions in general than for women. I think we have a, a strong cultural bias towards that. And this is um, um, very much related with the diversity policies that can be implemented, right? Um, 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 inside the, the, the institution so we can um, um, finally, um, 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 not motivate, but to improve in that regard. And um, um, the, the other aspect that I would like to, to include, um, which was something that we included in the report, but was not included in my presentation, which refers to girls' education. And I think um, um, it would be very uh, beneficial to start from a younger age, like um, allowing girls to lead or motivating them to lead even when they are at a younger age. Right, so um, I'm contributing to this culture of, 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 of um, um, female in leadership um, um, in general. These are just a couple of ideas that I had now, and I hope they are useful, Dr. Fall. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also not losing sight of the training that's required for our, main co our male colleagues and boy children too. Um, and um, so the other side of the main questions that came across, that I wanted to um, address to the four regional um, presenters, if I may, is to reflect on what is it in terms of society and culture that is either contributing to, or how is it that we could address the, um, the types of issues that women face in, in culture more generally. So we had one question, which I see uh, Jose Quintero has already, um, has already answered in terms of um, violence against women. What are the other cultural issues that might be affecting the inequalities that we're seeing in higher education? So, um, right, uh, Jose, sorry, it's Jose Quintero. Jose, maybe you'd like to just pick up that question first. I think if we have one minute for each of the panelists, then we should finish just about on time. Yes, well, um, um, I don't know if my, I may respond in, in, in Spanish and ask the assistant of the translator. There is a, hay una, hay un, en Latinoamérica, voy a hablar por Latinoamérica. Recuerden ustedes que, eh, digamos, con la conquista se hizo un trasvase de los valores de la España patriarcal a Hispanoamérica. Y estos valores, digamos, expresaban la existencia femenina a través de la doncellez, de la fidelidad y de la práctica de los valores cristianos. Pero realmente no había ninguna otra educación que estuviera dirigida a la mujer. No será hasta 1670, por allí, o 72, que realmente surge la primera publicación este, que 
digamos, recoge una crítica racional a el porqué de la desigualdad de los sexos. Eh, y no será este, hasta, mil, hasta finales del siglo XVII que aparece en Latinoamérica lo que podríamos decir la primera feminista. Y este, no será hasta bien entrado el siglo XIX que la mujer entra en Latinoamérica de manera masiva a la educación. En consecuencia, estamos hablando de centurias en la que la educación a la mujer ha sido denegada y eh, culturalmente hay un pesado legado que hay que vencer. Eh, sin embargo, eh, creo que eh, cada vez se logra a una velocidad eh, mayor y eh, en este sentido también hay que decir que aunque existen en nuestra región reductos de machismo, indudablemente, tenemos que decir que eh, cada vez más este, eh, esos valores, eh, digamos, eh, eh, se van reduciendo, ¿no? Eh, culturalmente, eh, como decía una de las panelistas, cada vez eh, el, 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 la mujer se personifica en la sociedad a través de otros valores distintos y más equiparados con los del hombre. Gracias. Gracias, José. So, could I ask um, maybe uh, Reka, Professor Reka Papu, could we have your answer from the regional perspective on that question? Oh, that would be difficult actually to summarize uh, what the barriers and enablers uh, due to sociocultural factors in South Asia are. Um, I just want to uh, perhaps clarify uh, the point I made about uh, education of girls now increasingly being valued. Uh, it is rather instrumental because uh, women then go on, as I said, they do not get into employment. So their education is seen as being necessarily for uh, reproduction of social status. So it's not, uh, so women opt out of employment so that they can stay back at home and uh, the education of children is an important responsibility of women. So this I'm hoping uh, in one minute can give you the essence of a certain kind of societal expectation in relation to women's education. That's a very important observation to, to hear. Thank you very much. Okay, Ndongjata, would you like to come in for one minute on this last point? Yeah, okay, thank you very much. I think this is quite pertinent, but in, because in the case of Africa, I think it's a belief system. You know, there is a lot of conservatism and um, in most of the religions that are embraced, uh, you would really consider a situation where you cannot get the approbation of those who are in charge to see women's role as important. So women really tend to have a mindset that they are just the second class citizens. So whether it is uh, violence, uh, whether it is um, positions, you know, whatever you think of, we have to start there. That's why I'm saying it's not just about policy, it's about sociocultural practices and the need for further sensitization because it works when we are able to sensitize the women. It's the women that can make the difference. It's the women who rear the children. And if even if silently and quietly, we are getting them to understand that the two genders are the same and can likely make the same contribution, we would see a difference. So it's the belief system. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's wonderful. It looks like we've um, lost Chloe, unfortunately. So with that, I will say thank you again to all of the panelists for they're uh, answering those questions and hand back to Sarah. Uh, hi, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Paul. Um, to close this event, we would like to invite Caroline Medel Anonuevo, head of the education unit of the UNESCO Regional Office for Southern Africa to share the conclusions of today's dialogue. And um, so over to you, Mrs. Medel Anonuevo. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. It's not easy to uh, summarize a very fascinating and nuanced discussion, but let me start by saying that 25 years ago, in 1995, the Beijing Platform for Action agreed that one of the critical areas of concern 
is education and training of women. 20 years later, with the SDG agreement, we now have a global platform to look at higher education through target four, which says, especially in the target about higher education, ensure equal access for all women. And by doing so, we now have a global indicator for the first time since five years ago on global enrollment ratio for tertiary education by sex. And this has framed our discourse on women and higher education. So it is not surprising that we are talking only about access because that is where the data is. And it's interesting, I think the first point about the current status, what we see is in fact, let me move, I think, what we see is in fact, we are just talking about enrollment. So when we say participation, we need to understand that we are talking about participation in terms of enrollment. That's why two panelists have also indicated how about completion. So I think the first important element to say is when we look at current situation, it is no wonder that the report from ISAL is indicating that there is improvement. And according to the global education report, in fact, female enrollment tripled in tertiary education. And even at the country level, gender disparity at men's expense, meaning gender disparity in favor of women, exists in 74%. So we can see that if we use this indicator alone, that enrollment is equal to participation, then we will have the conclusion that in fact, women's status vis-a-vis -vis higher education has improved. But, and I think that's a big but, and I think Daniela has also explained in terms of how about participation in research, participation in management positions, and participation in degrees. Again, I think what is happening with all these indicators is we're going, we're getting quantitative data about access. And indeed, you have seen that in many of the panelists, they agreed, although there are nuances in terms of numbers, because in the Gulf and in the South Asia, in South Asia and also in uh, some parts of Africa, there are also discrepancies. So while we see a global increase in terms of women's participation vis-a-vis -vis enrollment, in fact, this is just one important aspect because in fact, there are differences in terms of courses. No, and we know again, so it's not only about enrollment, but where, where are they going? So in terms of going, we see that there are lags. So even if we see an increase, are lags in terms of areas where people, where young women are going. And it's very important. It has been mentioned in many regions, STEM, women are absent. And we heard in uh, South Asia that religious education, women are not allowed to enter. And I will add here, for example, that in Africa, where basically you have agricultural economies, economies based on agriculture, there are studies which show that like there are almost more, there are more than 200 universities, public universities in Africa, and there are 100 courses, programs offering agricultural education agricultural education is not a preference for women, even if we know that in Africa, agriculture is one area where women are working, where women are in the fields. But when it comes to formal education, that is not their field of preference. And we, for those, like if there, I see the figures, like 25% of women go to agriculture, yet, what kind of fields do they go? They don't go to the hard agricultural science like soil, genetic engineering, but they go to, again, the life-giving agricultural science. So this being said, in terms of access, I think we need to understand that because we have been framed 
by this, this discourse on access to higher education enrollment, it is no wonder that the policies are also framed in this way. So we've heard the different policies which say that, yes, let's give access in terms of making sure that we have more provision for higher education. It has helped that in many countries, not only the South Asian family said that there is provision for primary and secondary. So that leads to tertiary. So that's a very important policy. But we also know that curriculum reforms where people are more aware that in fact there are gender discrepancies, that this needs to be early on reflected in the countries, in the curriculum needs to be, is also important. And I think very oh, miss, important. Uh, uh, I have it one, time is up. Yeah, uh -huh. I have one more the important time is up. thing. What's more important is the policies on sexual harassment and gender-based violence, which is paving the way for women to participate and go beyond just access. I wanted to say one last thing about the SDG, the future. The future is we need to, we have seen a range of policies that need to be context specific because gender is a social construct. Therefore, the future is contradictory for many other women, but for some women, they are in advance. But I think the gender index is very instrumental in making understand that women are getting to the numbers in terms of having access, but there is still a long way to go in terms of real contribution to the SDG4. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Medela Nonuevo. Now we would like to welcome Dr. Frances Pedro, Director of UNESCO ESAC, to close the event. Over to you, Dr. Pedro. Thank you very much. After so many interesting insights, there is little I can add to that. I would like simply to use this couple of minutes, first of all, to express uh, my deepest gratitude to Norak and to Moria Fall and all her team. I think it has been really uh, a wonderful experience for, for us at ESL to work together with them, but certainly we have some warm homework to do. First of all, uh, um, my first homework is certainly to invite all the participants to join NORAC as soon as possible. It's, it's, if you are working in, in fields like this, I mean, being member of NORAC is a must. Second, the homework is that maybe for next year, because there is a commitment by ESL to continue supporting the International Women's Day, we should think about having something drafted together, Moria. And I think that will be really excellent. Those are my first, um, say, uh, 60 seconds. And my other 60 seconds will go to express my gratitude to all the participants, not only to those who have taken the floor. I mean, I have learned a lot, but also to those who have been passionately, you know, um, um, in a way, following the discussions. I think that this has been really wonderful. And once again, we have some homework to do. I think that... Uh, when I started at ESL um, almost two years ago, we decided to go for this uh, particular way of celebrating the International Women's Day by providing evidence about where we are. Last year, it was mostly focused on uh, senior management in higher education institutions in Latin America. This year, we have been successful in, the, in, in a way in having a global perspective. And next year, I think that rather than um, keeping an eye on diagnostics, we should be more looking into the future and certainly taking note of those successful strategies that both national governments as well as uh, in individual institutions have been taken in order to not only breaking the uh, glass ceilings, but also making sure that we as uh, actors in the higher education arena do more than simply welcoming more and more females to our classrooms, that we really help to transform the world and making uh, it really more equitable also from a gender perspective. So once again, thank you very much. Back to you, Sarah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pedro. So on behalf of the team at NORAC and at UNESCO, yes, I would like to thank you all to our distinguished guests, speakers today for their participation and to all of you for attending this event. 
to commemorate the International Women's Day. As mentioned at the beginning, the Chilean visual translator, Fran Salomon, joined today's webinar to turn it into visual diagrams, her work, as well as the report. Launched today can be accessed on UNESCO ESL website and social media, and is also in the chat in, in today's chat, uh, webinar, the chat of the webinar. We invite you to visit the website, esl.unesco.org, for accessing these materials, including the link to the report. Goodbye and thanks and have a, a wonderful day. Thank you and bye bye. Bye to all. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank everyone. Bye bye.